it's really important to pay attention to who the students are that you enjoy teaching the most because you can start that will affect your marketing going forward and you can start to attract more of those students and it'll be more satisfying for you Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day everyone, welcome back to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode 113 and if you're one of my inner circle piano teaching community members, a very special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show and if this is your first time here, then thank you so very much for tuning in. I do hope you get a lot out of this episode. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, of course, is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. Today's show notes and full transcript are available now at timtopham.com slash episode 113. This episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by the Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano, a digital hybrid piano created by Casio in conjunction with acoustic piano manufacturer C. Beckstein. I don't know about you, but I have five main challenges when it comes to pianos in my studio or problems. Uh, No room. I I work in a really small studio. Pianos are really expensive. Uh, Pianos are really loud. (laughs) And I get really sick of getting them tuned because I play along with my students all the time using a digital piano along with the acoustic. As soon as I go out of tune, it gets really obvious. And finally, I have to pay for movers whenever I want to shift it around. So what's the solution? Well, Something digital, right? While the actions in digital pianos are improving weekly, if you want 100% peace of mind about the quality of a piano action, especially if you've only got one instrument in your studio, you definitely need to grab a hybrid. The hybrid piano takes the best of acoustics and digitals and puts it all in one package. And the Selviano by Casio is fantastic. It's got a great price point and it sounds and feels exactly like a grand piano because... Well, it basically is a grand piano inside a digital box. If you'd like to find out more, head to soundtechnology.com.au where you can find out where to buy and make sure you search by your suburb and area so you can go and test out one today. Okay, so if you're a new piano teacher or if you're getting back into teaching after a bit of a break, today's podcast episode is going to be so helpful for your planning. Even if you already have that studio established and you've got lots of students, you're sure to learn lots because we're going to unpack some of the basics of planning studio policies and business processes right through to performances and payments and even kids that don't practice. It's all about peas this episode, I think. There are lots of ways in which we can tweak our studio businesses and we're going to unpack some of them today. And I'm really excited because we've got another great freebie for you, which aligns perfectly with what we'll be talking about. Have you ever wondered how other teachers structure their studio policies? Having a policy and more importantly, sticking to it is critical when you're running an independent studio. So much of the talk I find in Facebook piano teacher groups are about people not having strong policies or not sticking to them or just not knowing what to do when it should be really, really clear in a policy. So today we put together a policy essentials planning pack to help you get started on the right foot. With background info and examples of policies from three experienced studio teachers, this will be one really helpful download. So to grab your Policy Essentials Planning Pack, head to timtopham.com slash episode 113. Now, we spent time with my guest first back in episode 80 of the podcast when she was talking all about beginning piano teacher games. And then she actually came on again, episode 95, when we talked about how to build a piano studio website from scratch. Perhaps you can already guess who this superstar teacher is who I've got on my show today. She has now set up her own website of piano teaching games at vibrantmusicteaching.com while she continues to work as a piano teacher, blogger, and creator of inspiring resources for piano teachers. She is also one of my team here at the Tim Topham Podcast and community manager in my inner circle, of course. Today, we welcome back the spectacular Nicola Canton. Hi, Nicola. 
<laughs> Thanks, Tim. Great to be back. <laughs> you are actually my first triple repeat, 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 repeat guest. How about that? <laughs> you should be really proud of that. What a distinction. I know. <laughs> and I tell you what, the beginner piano teaching games episode is one of the top 10 most popular. So you did a wicked job on that. And the number of downloads we got of your, can you remember what you called it? It was uh, your Ninja Power Pack or something. Yeah. Gamified Piano Teaching Power Pack. Gamified Piano Teaching Power Pack. I don't know where I got ninjas from. that's right. Uh, Yeah, I think that is right. That was one of the most popular podcasts um, downloads of recent times. So if you haven't uh, listened to that episode, then you get you can get a really great feeling for what Nicola is all about and the kind of games that she's written and um, compiled in her website um, over at that episode. But today we're not talking about games. We're talking about slightly more serious things, but we'll make it fun for you. It's all about planning, both for new and experienced <laughs> teachers. So many of us fall into that for that category of we just kind of start teaching, maybe without much training, often quite young. And so sometimes our planning process is, well, non-existent. So Nicola, what are some of the pitfalls of this approach to running a studio, which so many of us do, at least at the start? Yeah, well, it's certainly what I did. <laughs> I started teaching at 16, so I didn't plan anything. Uh, I just jumped in and started teaching someone in the neighborhood. Um, I think some of the most common things that go wrong, number one, is that it causes you headaches because you constantly have to keep reworking everything you're doing all the time and keep sort of rejigging everything because you haven't planned it in the first place. You also in most cases, not all, will end up making less money, which is not something any of us want. And I think the biggest one for me is that you'll probably be less satisfied as a teacher. You'll have less job satisfaction because you won't have the studio that you want and that fits you and your teaching style and your goals and and your philosophy. And of course, you need to have those goals and philosophy before you begin if we're going to be able to build our business on it. (laughs) But I want to pick you up on one of those things because one of them really stuck out to me and like sent alarm bells off and that was less money. Why? Tell me me about how planning relates to potentially having less money or lack of planning. Oh, in so many ways. I mean, if you're really planning carefully, you're planning for how much you want to make. So you know, that would lead to more money because you're designing exactly how your income should look. But also just little things like not factoring in that you need to pay for a recital venue this year. And then that comes up and you have to pay for it out of pocket because you didn't include that in your tuition. Or, you know, you don't schedule the students properly. So that leads to problems. There's all sorts of things that if you just planned them out in advance and took a few days of your time to do that and invested it up front, you'd make more money in the, over the course of the year. Mm. And there's two big things that I see uh, mistakes piano teachers making in that. And one is to not realize that all the money that they take in isn't their income. Oh, isn't sorry, their income. sorry. It, is their, it is their income, but it's not it their It is profit. their income, but it's not their, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, people make the mistake of thinking like that this is their hourly rate, like you would make if you made wages. Right. You know, correct. In, yes. a, in a regular job, but it's not. Your teaching rate is not your hourly rate that you're actually making. Yeah. Because you have to do all this other stuff. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I know that you've got some great resources and we may even talk about it today about some of those calculations that teachers need to do to really work mm-hmm. out what is your effective hourly rate. Uh, because it is not the 50, 60, 70, 80, $100, whatever it is that you take in for an hour's lesson. In fact, it may well yeah. be less than half of that. So um, it's a really important thing. The other th- mistake I see teachers making when they lack that planning is that they can't factor in things ahead of time. You mentioned recitals, but I'm also thinking particularly PD, uh, subscriptions yeah. to magazines, online training courses, things like that. If you plan ahead that can all be factored into your tuition. And so you can actually cover those costs without having to go, oh, no, I, need, I really need to do this course on summer camps, but I don't have another 100 bucks to, to do it because you've already planned yeah, for the it. Yeah, so. the cost of that and the time to do it, right? Right. That needs to be set aside as well. Just like if you were working in a school, well, I don't know about everywhere else, but here you'd be sent on certain training days every year. So, you know, you need to factor in those days as well. 
Yeah. And uh, we have, yes, if, if you're a qualified teacher over here, you have to do those planning days and you have to mm. um, assess your hours and things like that. Of course, piano teachers working from home, there's really no regulation at all. So none of us need to do anything. But of course, we hope that everyone listening to this is a regular attender at professional development conferences, workshops, online courses, and those sorts of things. Okay, yeah. so uh, let's dig into the planning process a little bit more because I think we've covered those advantages and the you know the reasons why we should be thinking this way a little bit more. But how do how do we get started? What's the what's the blueprint? I guess. Yeah, I mean. I really like the idea of starting with, I call it starting with why, but I also really like what Leela Fiss said last week about having a mission as a teacher. It's the same kind of idea that you have this overarching goal or this why behind your teaching, and that really can structure everything you do. It sounds sort of, you know, up in the clouds and that kind of thinking, but it really can affect, you know, how long your lessons are the format of them, the location, who the students are you teach, the business and the policies you have and the money, everything, the way you market your studio, everything can stem from that. So that's what I like to start with is, is start with your philosophy as a teacher. What did it, What is it essentially that you want your students to be able to do? You know that I love talking about philosophies and mission and values and vision and all that kind of stuff, but I'm interested to know, I've never asked you this, what's your primary mission or vision for your studio? My main thing is that I want my students to be able to play the piano for their whole life for their own enjoyment. So I'm not really about performances or, I mean, I want them to have performance experience so that they can do that if they want to, but I'm not. That's why exams are secondary to that. Everything else is secondary to that because I want them to play for their whole life. My thing I want to avoid is them getting to grade eight, which happens here, and then just stopping. They just, that's it. They've completed piano now. They have and they're going finished. To finish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, look, we both, uh, and that's why I enjoy spending time with you so much because we're both on exactly the same wavelength. It's about helping set the students up so that they can, uh, they've got the skills and the want and the drive to play piano forever or be involved in music, not even play piano, but be able to yeah, then yeah, yeah. pick up a guitar when they're older and go, oh, I'm, I'm a musician. Like to think of themselves as a musician. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I've, I've, might have mentioned this on a previous podcast, but there's that when, when students are going through early teenagehood, early, early adolescence, uh, there is a, a really distinct time when a lot of them tend to drop off at that sort of 13, 14 kind of age. And it's amazing how if they just pass that little hill and they get over that, they start to self-identify often as musicians. They'll say, I'm a musician. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll, their friends will know it. They'll know it. They'll feel confident about it. And from then on, the snowboard just keeps on going and it becomes much easier. But just getting over that initial hill is difficult. So if we as teachers can give them those skills to push through that early adolescent tween teen age, often they'll get to that mindset of, oh, I, I can do this. I'm a musician and I want to do this forever. And that's, yeah, that's the ultimate, right? Yeah, because that's when they're searching for their identity anyway. So if they end up sticking with it that becomes part of yeah who they are exactly yeah so have you got a process or is there any suggestions you've got for teachers about how they can come up with this idea i mean for some who might have been teaching for 20 30 years this they might not have ever thought about this so any any tricks or tips on that i think one good place to start is maybe where music fits in your life you know are you someone that loves gigging? Do you want to create other gigging musicians? Are you someone that loves playing for church? Maybe you want to play, create students who w- would be able to do that or whatever else it is that you love about music because I think that'll drive everything forward if it's the aspect of music that you really enjoy. Like I just like playing in the room for no one, for myself. So, you know, I How want that selfish pleasure of you, Nicola. just to get, yeah, <laughs> but just to get lost in music, you know, that's the best part for me, not playing for other people. And so but, do you tend you to know, give your students the skills that will enable them to do the same thing? 
yeah, to explore repertoire. One of my big things is trying to make them independent. You know, I don't want them to rely on me to come up with answers or eventually even questions. They should be able to work through something and practice it and figure out how it how it goes or or what they need to look up to figure it out mm. by themselves. Yeah. And I look back on my own teaching and you know, the thing that I love more than anything is working with, uh, I particularly like teenage students and older students and I love working on chord-based composing popular music lead sheet playing. And so that's what I do uh, and that's what I really enjoy doing. So I would be asking people who are listening, if you're unsure about this or you've never thought about your vision or your passion or whatever it is, just have a think about what, as Nicholas says, what do you like doing the most and maybe that is the thing that you can become maybe even known for in your area or you mm-hmm. could differentiate your studio by being the person that does that, helping students play for church or whatever it is. Um, and the thing I wrote down when you were talking just then, Nicola, is marketing. This is, it, mm-hmm. it connects yeah. perfectly into marketing, right? Yeah, it's everything because then you start not talking to everyone and therefore no one, but actually talking to a specific market that cares about your philosophy and what you have to say. Right. Uh, and I get questions, I'm sure you do, from from teachers in saturated areas with many piano teachers, mm-hmm. often many teachers around them who are charging ridiculously low prices and really struggling to find a name for themselves. And it, it really comes back to this question. I'm so glad you've brought up this idea of having a vision and then using that decision that you've made in your marketing to differentiate yourself, to make people go, well, that's why this teacher is charging more and that's why I should go to them. So I see, uh, as you do, a lot of very similar questions coming up in Facebook groups, often to do with things that haven't been planned so well at the beginning. And we've talked already about why that's the case. And uh, and we've all been in that situation because many of us start uh, with a very um, unplanned studio. So let's talk through some of the main areas of, of problems that teachers have and, and give them some tips if that's all right. And l- I, why don't we start with policies given that that's what our freebie is about today. Yeah, policies. I think there's two mistakes with this. Well, three, maybe. So there's not setting any policies, right, in the first place. (laughs) There's not sticking to them. And then there's also the mistake of just overstressing about them and overemphasizing them that I see a lot. So teachers will be asking these questions, you know, it says this in my policy and I need to change the wording because parents aren't paying me on time or whatever. But that's not really about what the policy says. That's about parents respecting you and paying you on time. And no policy is going to magically fix that. So I think if you stop thinking about it as the policies are going to, if I find the right policies, it's going to magically fix everything. It's never going to be this legally binding contract that people have to be held to. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So policies to me are about setting expectations for parents of the most common things that come up in your studio. My policies are only one page. People get them in the download. They're literally one page long because that covers everything that comes up all the time. So the key things that I think people should cover, there's three that I think are essential. Late payments. What happens if they don't pay you on time? Nothing. Or something You're right. yep. that needs to be outlined in the in the policy. So, do you have a date that it has to be due by, and what happens if they go over that? You know, whatever that is got, whatever solution is comfortable for you, that's what you set up there. What are you going to do about makeup lessons? The dreaded uh, yeah. makeup lessons. <laughs> yeah, the rabbit um, hole of makeup lessons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And clearly define it. Don't call them makeup lessons because that doesn't mean the same thing to a parent that you're meaning in Facebook groups. You know, some people mean a makeup lesson is someone who no shows and some people mean rescheduling. So just be really clear. And then punctuality. What happens if the student is late and what happens if you're late, if you're traveling to them or if you can't make it back home in time or if you have to miss that kind of thing. Yeah. So those are three essentials and then other than that it's just about the questions that parents ask you just start taking note of them during the year and then they go in your policies for next year if they're asked several times so you know in some communities parking is an issue there's specific places you have to park or if you require lessons 
certain number of lessons every summer that might go in your policies, or maybe you um, require all students to perform in one recital a year. If that's something you have, that should be in your policies. Anything that parents might not know to expect and that they should. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're well, just just going over those. Uh, you brought up the legal issue uh, earlier on, which I, I'm really glad you did because while we love seeing these documents as a legal binding contract that we could take people to court over. It's not going to happen in reality, and you don't no. really want to get to that stage anyway. So, yeah. you, I, I really like that you're looking at them. Yes, uh, a teacher, sorry, a parent is signing them and agreeing to those terms on sign up to your studio, but they're expectations, and there will be parents who either forget them or ignore them or haven't read them properly or whatever. So. You, you'll need to kind of guide them a little bit, right, rather than jumping down their throat or freaking out, as you say. Definitely. And you can't hand policies to a parent and expect them to read them. They're not going to read them. Yeah. I mean, we get stuff like this ourselves all the time. Put yourself in their shoes. Do you read all the things that you check boxes for and sign off on? Nobody does. It would be impossible. Yeah. So you have to go through with through them uh, with the parent. And that's why I suggest this, you know, a new student interview for every new student because of stuff like policies that you have to go through them. And it can be an absolutely plain conversational language. It doesn't have to be official and legal because it's not a legal document. Right. It yeah, can be it, friendly. And it's much more effective if it is legible and, and <laughs> can be read clearly. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I have a um, a tick box on my sign-up. So I do online sign-ups for new students and they have to check the box to be able to enroll their student. But as you say, you know, some do read it and ask me questions about it. I'm sure probably half don't or more. So I, I like that idea. In your first lesson, or your interview, go through it with them, with the parents, so it's very, very clear. One other thing that you mentioned, those three, so the, the top three things, billing, make sure you've got billing policies, make up lesson policies, and late, you being late or the student being late or missing lessons. The other mm -hmm. thing I wonder about is, which I think is more and more important these days, is an image use policy. I don't know if we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, I know you definitely use one. I use one because... We want to include student images on our websites. But really, for every studio, we should all have websites, number one. We should all be using student images on it. So uh, do you think that's that should be right up there as well in the policy? Absolutely. I just didn't put in policies because for me, it's a separate form mm -hmm. because I do give uh, parents that option. They can opt out. Right. So around maybe a quarter of my piano parents would opt out of photos and videos and I make sure to to you know adhere to their wishes, wishes or whatever yeah yeah but so that's separate from my policies just because it is actually part of the enrollment form but absolutely it should be included get that permission up front don't look for it later i have a feeling people listening are going to want me to go back and just ask you without going down too much down the rabbit hole Makeup lessons. Uh, what are your <laughs> what what are your thoughts people are going to be going i want to know what nicola does uh, <laughs> um if okay it depends let's define makeup lessons if we're defining makeup lessons as they missed a lesson like they didn't show up and then making it up afterwards some teachers do that i absolutely would never do that right they so if the student is just a no show sitting there yeah if they're yeah. a no show with no, no explanation chance. or contact you don't give them a makeup and i'm yeah. the same yep yeah and if they contact me in, in advance, what the way I word it is that I'll try to uh, reschedule the lesson if there's a time available, such as another student's cal cancellation. That's the way I word it in my policies. So as right. you can imagine, that very rarely happens. I can hardly ever reschedule. I have a full timetable, so it's just not going to happen. And I'm not going to get up you know, at 8 a.m. on a Saturday to go <laughs> teach a lesson. That's just... <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's that's fair to them. And ultimately, when making decisions like this, I think it's a really good idea to always come back to the other students. If you do this, will you be a worse teacher for your other students? Yes, you will, because you're going to be in a bad mood all day Saturday. And you're <laughs> such as other students, so that's not fair to them. Right. So whenever you know teachers are tempted to bend over backwards, think about the big picture of your whole week and all your students. 
And are you taking time or your energy or your enthusiasm away from them? If so, I don't think it's fair. So yeah, re reschedules only if I have another student's cancellation open. Yeah, that's my policy. That's a good point. I've never really thought about that impact on other students. Uh, we should also think about the impact on our families and our own personal yeah. lives and our health. Uh, you know, if you're if you've got a full studio of forty students every week and a quarter of them for some reason there's a camp on or a public holiday or something or whatever it is and they all miss or forget and you try and reschedule them, you know, just it's a nightmare for one. But yeah. And and I, I've found, I don't know about you, that that parents when you're strict and you stick to your agreement, uh, mm -hmm. they they get the message pretty quickly that you're not a walkover and that their child needs to be at the lesson or they need to tell you. Or it's just a missed opportunity. It's just, you know, and the more you can shift their thinking and emphasize the whole picture of what you offer in your studio, you know, you it isn't just a lesson. You've done all this planning, you've got your professional development, you've got recitals, you've got all this other stuff. I have group lessons every year. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. So if they miss one lesson, that's life. Stuff comes up. And if they know that from the start, most of the parents in my studio who've known that from the very beginning never have a problem. Mm. You know, you'll occasionally get one, but that's life. Yeah. You just okay. have to take it on the chin and be strict about it. Good good to know. Thank you for uh, letting us in on your um, own policies on that. All right, so let's move on to lesson length. Uh, this is something that's come up a fair bit recently, moving to 45-minute lessons. Should I, shouldn't I, how do I do it? Uh, any thoughts on that in the planning of your studio? First of all, for any new teachers listening who are brand new to this or thinking about starting their own studio, fantastic. Don't offer 30-minute lessons right. <laughs> from the very start. And for teachers that are switching, I really, I think if you if you frame it in the right way to parents, the values of the longer lesson for students, that you can sell them on it fairly easily at the, at the start of a new semester or a new year. And it it's really so essential you know 30 minutes is just not enough time and just because your teacher did it that way maybe for your all your piano studies is not a good enough reason for you to do it because there's just so much other stuff to be teaching you know there's all the different things that teachers are constantly complaining about trying to fit into lessons the improvisation and the sight reading and the games and the whatever else is going on so if you only have 30 minutes, it's just not long enough. I reserve 30 minute lessons for um, under, well, under six is so five and under. Right. Can have 30 minute lessons um, in the very beginning. And that's it. They're the only ones who actually take that, that lesson length in my studio. So, right. Yeah, a lot of uh, teachers would probably wonder how you uh, keep a six-year-old engaged for 45 minutes. But I'm imagining that's just with lots of varied activities and movement and games and things like yeah, that, right? Easily with games, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, getting on and off the bench. I actually, most students in my studio now do 40 minutes solo and then 20 minutes overlap. So they actually have a 60 minute lesson, but it's um, 40 minutes one on one and then 20 minutes with the next student. Right. Okay, great. Yeah. A kind of partner lesson. Is that what you call those? I call it buddy. Buddy lessons. lessons. Yeah, 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 great. And that's you know, when, when you, we're talking about planning studios, the, there are obviously many different types of lessons you can provide from group to individual and then combinations of those. So there's lots of information out there. If you are a new teacher listening to this and wondering, wondering about partner or buddy lessons, then just Google that and you'll be able to find plenty of information about it. It's a great idea. We, uh, we, we talked a little bit earlier about... Um, choosing ages and levels that you like to teach and that being part of your mission potentially and your vision. What what planning ideas do you have around that for teachers? In the beginning, the reluctance might be that they can't pick and choose between different students. You know, they have to take the students that come in because they have to make money. And we totally get that. And I'm not saying don't take the students that come in, but it's really important to pay attention to who the students are that you enjoy teaching the most because you can start that will affect your marketing going forward and you can start to attract more of those students and it'll be more satisfying for you 
during your teaching day because you'll be teaching the students you love teaching the most. So I think this is really about if you already have students, if you don't try imagining, if you already have students, just start noticing who gives you the most energy each day. Who, who is it that when you finish the lesson, you go, oh, that was great, you know, and yeah. you just feel energized by the process rather than dragging through it. Right. If there are certain students that you're dragging through the lessons, like I love teaching preschoolers. That is not everyone's cup of tea. It is just so much energy. And I certainly couldn't do, you know, five of them back to back. That's impossible. Yeah. So if you are not willing to get up and down off the bench, you know, every two to five minutes and get climb on around on the floor, yeah. playing with things. Yeah. If you're not willing to do that, then don't teach preschoolers. You don't have to. Just because people are talking about it doesn't mean you have to do it. If right. you don't enjoy teaching pop or, um, you know, engaging in that way with teens, then you don't necessarily have to focus your studio on teens. You may get one or two that really suit you and that's it. And that's fine. Mm. Or adult students as well. That's another sort of divisive issue. Some people just do not enjoy teaching adults. Right. So if that's you take note of it and you don't have to refuse the adults in the beginning. It's something you can try and get better at, or you can just focus your attention towards the younger crowd when you're marketing. Mm. I'm really glad you brought up that we often start with that very mixed bag of students and we take whoever we can. I, I did the same thing. I traveled around as a teacher going to students' houses. I taught four daughters from the same family for 30 minutes each, one after the other in one house. Uh, I remember teaching an 86-year-old was one of my first students and I've tried youngest as it been about six and yeah, I, I've now got to the point where I know exactly what gives me most energy and what I'm most passionate about and I'm really glad that you've recommended teachers. Just, just look, just be aware of what mm -hmm. you're enjoying the most. I think that's such a great recommendation and then just start to try and get more of those kinds of students as you as other ones move on. I think that's just such a great approach. Thanks for that, Nicola. All right. Uh, let's plan for kids that don't practice. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, let's rephrase this in a more positive way. How, how do we plan for effective practice and kids making regular progress? How about that? Okay. That's, that's certainly more positive. Um, <laughs> How do we plan for effective practice? Step one is a practice routine. So ignore effective practice in the beginning is my suggestion. Two to three months, um, like for the first two to three months of teaching a new student, it's all about creating the routine. And that if they are under, let's say, 12, especially, it's about talking to the parents. Mm. A kid cannot do that. They cannot turn up at the piano every day at five. If they can... You're in luck You've with got that a one special student, child. but it's not going to work the next time. <laughs> yeah, agree. Yeah. So um, from the very beginning, from the interview lesson that I do with parents and students together, we talk about practice expectations and practice habits, but it doesn't stop there. I think that's one of the big mistakes is they just, well, you've told them now, so... I've told them what they're supposed to do. They need to go off and do it. No, it's your job to keep supporting them, keep checking in, especially in those first few months that they are creating that routine and that things are going well. And if they're not, troubleshoot with them. Come up with ways that they can establish a routine and tie it to a different activity in the day, You know, whether it comes after homework or before di dinner. My best practitioners are the ones who do it uh, before school. <laughs> Right. Um, but that would be sold to every every family. But um, it does work amazingly when they can do it. And then after that, you can worry about it being effective and coming up with strategies and implementing them. Yeah, parent, in the lesson at home. Parents really need educating in just yeah. go, knowing that they need to set a practice routine for their child and it's okay to drag them up. To, well, hopefully they're not dragging them, but, you know, take them to the piano guide them a little bit. That is just so important. And I find teachers, uh, parents often just don't realize that that's, they need no, to they do don't that. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And they will be dragging them if it doesn't happen in the first few months. Mm. That's where it gets really, really tough. But if it happens from the very beginning, it's usually not a fight at all. Right. So, 
And so routine first, once they're in a routine, then you'll know, you know they're actually at the piano. So then it's about guiding their practice to make sure it's effective. So making sure they're obviously not playing start to finish and they're blocking and all those kinds of things. I'm sure there's lots of information yeah. out there for, for teachers, young and old, about effective ways of getting students to practice. But you know what? It's just it's almost the most important thing we need to do because it is, yeah. all their time is spent not with us. So it is absolutely crucial. Uh, I don't know if you've seen – actually, you have seen Robert Duke um, in action uh, at conferences. Yep. Uh, he's a professor in the United States uh, of education, music education, and he his his big thing, which I tr- have tried to do more and more since I've seen him in the middle of the year conferences, his big thing is to make sure that students are guided in the lesson about the kinds of ways they should play and practice at home. And so I'll sometimes, I, I could spend, I, I didn't used to do this, but I'll sometimes spend a lot of time making sure students are listening and able to articulate what they need to improve and then try it again and was that, you know, is that better? Let's try that again and really refining it because that's what they've got to do at home. I guess it's kind of next level once they've got the routine and know to chunk and that kind of thing. It's actually getting them to listen predominantly. Do you find that that's a oh, challenge yeah. for you too? Getting students to listen? To their playing, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah to their own playing, yeah. It's massive. Yeah. It seems so strange, um, but it's just so important. So for new teachers, if you find your students don't listen, you're that's totally normal. <laughs> as ridiculous yeah, as it you, sounds. You do need to literally tell them repeatedly to listen. Yeah, and what um, to listen for st- and how to listen. Yeah. Yeah. I have one student right now who constantly backtracks, like he plays a note wrong and then he fixes it and then he fixes it and then he keeps going. And he has no idea it even happened when he finishes the piece. Like he could have done it 10 times and he has no recollection. Wow. So, yeah. So you would record him and play it back so that he can, can he then, yeah, he then notices that. it? Yeah. yeah. He has a really good, his mom is great at practicing with him and stuff. So we're working on it together. But yeah, yeah. he just takes a lot of repetition to get them to listen to themselves. Definitely. Yeah, so, so important. Um, and what about tracking progress, Nicola? Either how, how do you do that or how do you recommend uh, teachers track progress? And that could be tracking what they do week to week or milestones as they go along. Yeah. Um, I recommend setting goals for your students for a semester or a year at a time and then just keep notes for yourself. I actually... What I do now is I create a Google Doc, which is shared with the parent, and I set up the goals there and what books they're working on and, you know, reminder videos or stuff they should listen to, and then notes every 10 weeks just on how they're getting on. It's really informal, just some notes. It doesn't take me long, and just to fill them in on how it's going. And then once you have the goals, that's where you can break it down into week by week what it is you're going to get done towards those goals. But if you don't know where they're going, even if you're new to teaching and you can't accurately, you know, estimate how far they're going to get, it's good to at least have written down something so that you can reassess later. If you have only thought it, um, you don't learn a lot from that process. So setting goals individually for each student or for your whole studio, if you have specific goals for the whole year for your whole studio, and then tracking how you're getting on with those goals and how the student is going week to week and setting things from there. So in the Google Doc that you share with your parents, do you uh, make notes after each lesson or just at the end of every 10 weeks, I think you said? Yeah, this is just um, every 10 weeks. So at the start of the semester, I set up goals. So I do three primary goals, three secondary goals. Mm Mm-hmm. And they could be anything. It could be learn all the major scales or it could be, you know, improve staccato technique. It could be anything right. that's important. And then from there, I just take literally bullet points like yada, yada. This is how Emma's going. This is good. This is not so good. She could use help with this, etc. Right. Okay. And then week to week practice notes. How do you do you use paper and pen for those? What do you do? No, I used to use uh, assignment sheets that I filled in during the lesson. This year, I've been experimenting with writing out all my assignments in advance. So I have been writing out assignment sheets or typing up assignment sheets in advance that I print off. And we use those 
I can use those as the lesson plans or the reference during the lesson. And if there's things we don't get to, I just cross them off. You know, it's not a problem. But most of the time I can pretty accurately estimate what I you know. I know my students pretty well, so I know what they're going to get to mm. and what a good strategy for that would be. So it, it allows me to think things out in advance of the lesson as well. We've had some great discussions in the Inner Circle forums about this and how different people plan lessons. Uh, and I quite like, I remember Sharon, uh, who might be listening, hello, Sharon, if you are, takes a templated ap- approach, which sounds a little bit similar to you. Um, so she actually, she has a plan, kind of a, a sequence written out for a number of weeks and they're repeated each page is the same. And then she kind of highlights on there the things that are achieved each week rather than having to manually hand write the same thing. It's a, a matter of mm-hmm. highlighting on a template, which I think is it's a great approach. I hadn't really thought about it that way. Um, so, yeah, uh, all, all good. I mean, you've got to find the thing that works for you, right? And it might be pen and paper and that's okay. Whatever works yeah. for you in your planning and to help your students develop, I think that's crucial. Yeah, and whatever the student is most likely to look at also. True. Because <laughs> that's always the battle. That is, yeah. And and if, if anyone is interested in Google Docs uh, and Google Sheets, uh, which are these online versions of Word and Excel, uh, the advantage, of course, is that you can share files between people. So you both look at the same file. It, it lives in the cloud somewhere. You don't have to keep attaching things to emails. This is a huge time saver. Uh, if you're unsure about Google, we've got actually a webinar on productivity and you can find that on my homepage. Just go to timtopham.com and at the top, there's a link to webinars. So find that webinar, go and watch it if you would like to find out about how Google works for these sharing files. It's such a great game changer. Yeah, uh, there's actually um, the... The way I'm doing these progress reports for parents, I'm pretty sure we shared a template for that in a post, so we can link to that as well if people are interested in seeing that. Oh, great! Um, a post, in my post uh, about Google, yeah. Oh, yeah. brilliant! Okay, we'll pop that in the show notes, so you can find that at timtopham.com/episode113, and we'll pop a note down for that. Thank you, Nicola. All right, well, let's start wrapping things up with the kind of the end of the road for a piano student. Well. Well, end of a, a section, which is performances. So any suggestions, tips on performance planning? If you know your mission or your why or whatever we want to call it, I think that can set up very well what kind of performance you're going to have. So if you have a very casual studio, there's no reason, just like you don't have to do 30-minute lessons just because your teacher did, you don't have to do the big formal recital with the grand piano if that's not what's relevant for your studio. So you can look into alternative venues and all that sort of thing. If you can do that more casual style recital, maybe you even want to do it with a digital piano that you can bring with you and go to a coffee shop. Maybe it's in a local school hall. Maybe it's, I know a lot of people in the States will do them in retirement centers or care homes and that kind of thing. That could be great or charity events. So think about what kind of event you want to have and what kind of vibe you want to have it. You want it to have first and then everything else can lead from there. And it really doesn't have to be super fancy and you don't have to give some huge speech. I know teachers get worried about the speech at the start, the welcome speech. So if that's you, just say, hi, thanks for coming. You're all wonderful. That's where the bathrooms are. Don't step out during the performances. (laughs) And then, you know, you don't have to be give this amazing speech at the start. So don't stress out about that if that is what's worrying you. And consider even if you can't afford to rent a recital venue or you can't find a good one, do small recitals just at your studio. You know, you can have 10 families at a time or whatever will fit in the room. I have my mid-year recital at home. I can fit exactly 33 people in my living room. So that's how many attend. And we do them in batches like that. So that's my January Jan. That's the informal one that I do mid-year. Mm. So even something like that can be fantastic at home. Yep. I love that idea. Just make it your own. Again, it's a diversification. Maybe you'll become known for the person that runs the very cool pop piano recitals or pop piano showcases with the the band and the drummers or mm-hmm. maybe you do a bit of you help kids with DJing on the side and maybe they're doing some of that while parents are walking in or maybe it's the piano's in the middle of the room and everyone's at tables having nibbles while the concert's going on. Like there are so many ways of doing concerts and 
it really, in my opinion at least, the traditional classical recital is not going to be something that a lot of parents, for one, will enjoy particularly because they've got to sit there and it's so straight jacketed and they don't know when to clap or not and all that kind of rubbish. Uh, secondly, the parent, uh, the the kids, you want it to be uh, accessible, mm-hmm. fun, engaging, not too terrifying. Uh, you don't want to scare off a perfectly good piano student just because they're forced to play at a traditional recital in a bow tie on a stage, right? So, yeah, really, I, I think you've 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 really nailed those points, uh, Nicola, in, in just. Yeah, making it your own. It's so important. Uh, have I forgotten anything, Nicola, or have we covered most of what we were trying to do today? No, I think we're good. Fantastic. Well, look, you can find out more about Nicola at her two brilliant websites. One is called Colorful Keys. That's C O L O U R F U L K E Y S dot I E. And vibrantmusicteaching.com, which is her own website of where all these games are now. It's a phenomenal website. She's also got a Facebook community. So check out all of her great resources. Nicola, thanks a million again for all your time today. Thanks so much. Now, don't forget to grab that freebie download we've been talking about. It's available at episode 113, timtoppen.com slash episode 113. And that, of course, uh, is the policy essentials planning pack so if you know that you need to get on top of your policies that's a great place to go thanks to all the review reviewers on facebook and itunes really appreciating those keep them coming through next time you're on facebook if you head to my page there's a review button and you can uh, help me out there and just as a quick update too I'll, i'll give you more information in december about this but my free apple and android app is finally coming out next month this will be the easiest way for you to listen to podcasts like this, read articles, search for resources, and generally stay up to date in your teaching. I'll give you more news about that, but it's been in a work in progress for some time, and I know it's going to hopefully make things so much easier for teachers to particularly access these podcasts and the blogs. All right, next week, it's a solo show. It's got a funny name. It's called, Do You Need a Piano Pivot? Now, this sounds a bit odd, right? But it's actually an introduction to one of the most exciting free global challenge events that I've ever run. And in actual fact, my guest today, Nicola, is going to be working on this with me. We'll be holding the first Piano Pivot in the week, December 4 to 8, 2017. And in next week's show, I'm going to give you a sneak peek into what's it, what it is all about. I'm Tim Topham. Thanks so much for listening. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.